Okay. Six o'clock in the morning. Second day, October 5th, 1986. I'm not gonna be Aunt Rosa. What is that sound that always fills my ears? Is it the sound of the rain? The sound of a waterfall? Or could it be radio static? If not, I want it to be the sound of blood flowing through my body. I want it to be the sound of the blood circulating throughout me, telling me that I am still alive. Suppose that's Shannon. Oh. It's him. Mm. Is it morning? The light entering through a crack in the curtain was faint, but it at least told him that dawn had broken. Kinzo was still in the position he'd been when he woke up. Still sitting in a chair and looking up at the ceiling, felt the blood slowly travel throughout his body. I thought it was him. I thought it was Shannon. Judging by the clock, it was early morning, six on the dot. No matter how tired he was, no matter how deeply he slept, he always woke up at exactly this time, as though he had measured it with an hourglass. He didn't think of this as something to boast about, but he told himself that as long as he could still manage this, his health couldn't be that bad. Morning has come, which means... Mm, it would appear I've avoided becoming one of the first sacrifices. Was I merely lucky when the roulette was spun, or is this the fruit of my efforts? How irritating that I cannot tell the difference, but I mustn't be bothered by such trivialities. Kenzo was struck by a faint desire to see beyond the study door. After all, he might find the traces of someone's vain struggle to break through the door, a sign that someone had tried to select him as one of the first six sacrifices. Mm. Humans are cheap creatures. Even though everything is ultimately decided by God, when humans are given good fortune, they arrogantly feel it was due to their own ability. That was why he wanted to check whether there was a wretched mark on the door. The very desire was human, and that was why Kinzo did not check. He often rejected desires that came to him because he was human. By doing that, he could be immersed in a feeling of sufficiency, as though he himself had become a being that surpassed humans. Yeah, but... Or maybe he's become a being that was below humans. That could also be the result of resisting human desires. He recognized human desires for what they were and grew guarded against them. <laughs> he hasn't been to the toilet in six years. <laughs> I don't want to imagine that. Things that a human would want to do, he resisted. This eccentricity and rebellious nature had surely given him a rare genius, making it possible for him to succeed in his exploits as he revived the Yoshirumiya family in a single generation. Well then, Beatrice, what were the six pieces you took? And what will your next move be? Entertain me. My defense is perfect. I will not shame myself like last time. Like last time? W what does that mean? Does he mean something in his past, or does he actually remember episode one? That's interesting. I wonder. The servants woke early. They had to open the curtains, prepare breakfast, and complete various other tasks to welcome the guests to a new day. Gouda, Gouda was the most enthusiastic. During the family conference, he had been told to concentrate his efforts especially on cooking, and he'd been specially exempted from several tasks that several servants normally must do. Gouda, who was a show-off, seemed to be feeling particularly superior because of that. What an ass. He let Genji and the rest prepare the rest of the mansion and worked on making breakfast in the kitchen. Genji split the work with Shannon and Kalon, and they carried on various tasks. Okay, so they're still alive. Shannon headed to the dining hall and knocked. Last year, the family conference had continued into the early hours of the morning. It wouldn't have been odd if this year's conference had done the same. Considering the possibility that they were still having a discussion inside, she knocked. But there was no response, so she opened the door and said good morning. And everybody was dead. Is that it? Good morning. Is anyone there? The room was cold, and the conference seemed to have ended a long time before. There was a tea set on the table from which they'd probably been drinking, arranged in a way that would make it easy to clean up. Cleaning up the tea was a servant's job. If the family members were extra generous and cleaned it up themselves, the servants would lose face. So it was a truly pleasant act of kindness for the family to do only this much. As she approached the table to clean it, she noticed something like a memo that had been left near the utensils and cups. 
Is it utensils? I'm not sure what the pronunciation is. Since it was right next to the tea set, Shannon picked it up, naturally thinking it was a memo for the servant doing the cleaning. Written there was not a request, nor was a thanks for preparing the tea. That reminds me, what happened to the letter? Or the letter? There were two letters, right? We never got to, uh... <laughs> we're all dead. Don't come looking for us. Okay, thanks, bye. <laughs> Written there was not a request, nor was a thanks for preparing the tea. That was just a single word. Shannon looked at it blankly and read it out loud. Chapel. Chapel. So there is like a... Okay. A small sound kept repeating over and over. Normally that sound would have been too trivial to be worth caring about. If only I could stop hearing it soon, I could go back to sleep right away. She thought vaguely. Who was she? Jessica? But no matter how much time passed, the sound did not end. Maybe it's the sound of blood dripping constantly from somebody's corpse. <laughs> it repeated over and over. Oh, shut up. Who is it? Banging on the door this whole time. Oh, okay. As soon as, as, soon as she realized that, she woke up. Someone was knocking. Then she noticed that it wasn't just a knock, but a voice as well. Oh, okay, it's Rosa. Rosa-sama, Rosa-sama, good morning. Wait, I I'm coming now. It had been Genji's voice. Please don't let it be cross-dressing, Genji. Looking at the clock, it was <laughs> even seven of yet. It was clearly too early to wake the guests. Did something happen that was bad enough to cause this? She felt her sleepiness increasingly fade thanks to this premonition of misfortune. Uh-oh. Though Genji was a servant, Rosa had known him since her childhood days, so even though she was slightly defenseless in her pajamas, she opened the door a crack and answered. Oh, I want to see that. Good morning. I apologize for waking this early. Did something happen? Yes. Actually, at the chapel. Uh-oh. <sighs> Who was there? Did she just murder all of them? I mean, it was... One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> it would fit. She probably was like, you know what? I'll just, I'll just use use the most efficient. Like I'll just kill you. Although I mean, it's sad. That she they they keep saying that the roulette decides, and it's not for her to decide. But then again, they say that she decided to spare Ka uh, Shannon if she did this or that. So maybe she can decide. I'm I'm confused. Can she or can she not influence this? We'll see. Genji whispered something into Rosa's ear. For a second, it seemed Rosa couldn't understand what she'd been told. After having it repeated several times, she realized that apparently something strange had happened. Rosa closed the door for a second, changed her clothes quickly, and followed Genji towards the mansion. Yeah, exactly. The, I don't think the chapel was ever mentioned or shown before. It seems to be a completely new place. The chapel requires some explanation. It wasn't in the mansion, but in a grove behind it, a short walk's distance away. It had been built at the same time as the mansion, so though its walls had been repaired many times, making it look new from the outside, it was a very old building. <laughs> the Deus Ex Chapel. Rosa dashed through the rain along with Genji. Just like the previous night, the rain was falling in earnest. I mean, I'm not really bothered by it. It, it doesn't seem like... It's not something that sounds like... Uh, completely pulled out of your ass. I could totally see there being a chapel and it was not mentioned before because it wasn't important before. But Beatrice decided to, to bring them all there. Eventually the chapel came into sight from beyond a thin grove. Just looking at it from the outside, it seemed a place of dazzling beauty where a pair of young lovers might want to get married. Like a certain two. However, Kinzo apparently viewed it as a very sacred place, so Rosa and her siblings had been given strict instructions not to approach it unnecessarily. Even though they were all grown up now, approaching the chapel for any reason would still make them feel guilty, and also afraid, as if their father might get angry and hit them in the fucking face. Good lord. The servants' silhouettes could be seen in front of the chapel's entrance, Goda, Shannon and Kanon, which meant that all of the servants on the morning shift had gathered. A short while ago, Genji had spoken to Rosa, telling her what the situation was. However, without laying eyes on it directly, she definitely hadn't been able to understand. It was probably the same for all the servants gathered here as well. Without seeing it with their own eyes, they wouldn't have been able to understand what was going on. 
Oh. Yes, I'm, I, th I think we all know what to expect now. On the door at the entrance to the chapel was something very large, drawn with a creepy stringy paint that made one think of blood. Something like a creepy magic circle. W what is this? When was it drawn here? The servants looked at each other. Goda was the first to open his mouth. But my apologies, we don't usually enter this building, so we don't know when it was made. Then who was the first person to find it? It was me. When I went to the dining hall to clean up the tea set, I found a memo with Chapel written on it. Shannon held out the memo with a shaking hand. Whose handwriting is this? Isn't it isn't Nissan or Nissan's? So after that, you came here and found this, right? Yes. Rosa Sama, look at this. What? Happy Halloween or what? Kanon pointed at a single line of English written below the creepy magic circle. Until it had been pointed out to her, she thought it was just in the part of the magic circle. There, the following words were written in English. Happy Halloween for Maria. Oh, damn. Happy Halloween for Maria? This creepy magic circle was for Maria? Happy Halloween? Yesterday, only one person had said Happy Halloween to Maria. The key phrase matched. It was the Golden Witch, Beatrice. What about Maria? She should be sleeping with her cousins, right? Did you check? My apologies. We just now realized that Maria Sama's name was written here. We still have not checked. Quickly. What are you doing? I'll go check on Maria and come back. Tell Klaus Nissan and the rest too. After that, follow their instructions. After saying that much, Rosa finally noticed that something was odd. Her own rank in this family conference was the lowest of the four siblings. Why had she been the only one called during an abnormal situation like this when the other siblings hadn't been? Yeah... Don't know what to tell you other than... Probably all dead. Even if Maria's name had popped up. Could it be her... What? Yes, we tried to contact Klaus Summer. But we couldn't find him. And Madame was not in her room. Judging by the condition of the sheets, she might not have returned to her bed at all last night. What about why didn't they go to Kinzo then? Rosa felt something creepy crawling slowly up her back. Did you check inside the chapel? No, not yet. We tried, but... Actually, the lock to the chapel is special, so the master key will not work. There's a single key that can open it, but that key is missing from the key box. Oh. She didn't want to get closer to the door with the creepy magic, magic circle if she could. Rosa readied herself and approached, then tried pushing and pulling the knob. All she felt was the resistance of the sturdy lock. We searched to see if there was a window we could enter through, but I think we'd have to break one of the windows if we wanted to check inside. Yeah, then just do that. What do you think? There's no way I can give you approval to do something like that. This is Father's precious chapel. At that time, the events of the previous days swirled around in the back of Rosa's mind. That's right. When I met that witch in the Rose Garden, didn't she hand Maria an envelope? Yeah, there's no mistake. She did hand it over. When Maria tried to open it, the witch told her not to do it yet. And then she surely said, the time to open that will come soon. Rosa was sure, but it could be no mistake. The envelope Maria had received was... supposed to be opened now. Guess she run it. she's running to, to Maria now. After dashing back to the guest house, Rosa approached the cousin room while hiding her footsteps, softly opened the door and peered inside. From the inside, she could hear the healthy snores typical of young people. There were four children, and Maria was there, sleeping soundly. Oh, the, the key might be in there. Damn, that would be crazy. After breathing a sigh of relief, she entered the room with quiet footsteps. She was after Maria's handbag, which was resting on the sofa. Maria always liked carrying her treasures around with her. She was probably um, emulating how her mother always carried her makeup with her. Of course, she was just imitating her mother, so everything on the inside was junk. 
In Maria's case it was full of small, creepy occult items, notebooks describing things of that nature and so on. Rosa had never been happy to see her daughter walking around with things like that, which weren't girlish at all. However, trying to force Maria to stop had resulted in a big fight, so she decided to let it be. Here. This is it. A western envelope with the crest of the gold eagle. When she took it out of the bag, she realized there was a heavy, vaguely cylindrical object inside. Oh, damn. Are you... I think you were right, Christian. <laughs> she could tell by its feel and its weight. There was no doubt. This was a key. <laughs> damn. Shit. <laughs> After turning around and checking that Maria was still sound asleep, Rosa tore open the envelope and the contents spilled out into her palm. It was a key with an old and intricate design. Rosa gripped that key and dashed out. Bettler seemed to have noticed that sound, but after grumbling and turning over in his sleep, he started snoring again. Okay, that definitely already makes it quite an impossible murder. I mean, if everybody in there is dead now, and it's locked, but the key has been in the envelope for an entire day already. How would that be possible? Then again, you could copy the key. I mean, that's possible. So I guess it's not entirely impossible after all. Genji-san, could this key be the key to the chapel? Where did you... Yes, this is the key to the chapel. Also, if everybody's dead in there now... Would that mean suspicion will fall on Rosa because she had the key? Rosa approached the creepy magic circle once again and put the key in the keyhole. There was a strong resistance. After it resisted for a short while, it stopped resisting with a clunk. Then, squeaking with a noise that hurt one's ears, it slowly, slowly began to open. Is anyone there? Her voice reverberated throughout the massive room. Of course there was no answer. The chapel had a high ceiling and the air was cold. And even on this rainy, unsettling day, it felt sacred for some reason. The servants timidly followed after Rosa. Rosa, Sama, look at that. Kanon noticed it immediately and pointed. Over there was the altar. In the place that would normally have a pastor preaching of God's love, there was a table that shouldn't have been there. At first it looked like a dining table, <laughs> it's a Halloween table. There actually were gorgeous plates and utens utensils placed there making it look like a child's birthday party or something. Utensils? Upon closer inspection the surrounding area had been decorated with pumpkins and black and orange ribbons. They were probably Halloween decorations. And there were people seated at the table. Wait. People seated at the table. Three on each side, and everybody has their throat slit or something. Three people on each side, facing each other, seated in chairs. Also, I just scratched my head, and then when my arm was down, because of the lag, I then saw myself scratch my head on the camera, but it looked like somebody was standing behind me, which <laughs> almost gave me a heart attack. Three people on each side facing each other, seated in chairs. They could be recognized at a glance. Klaus and his wife, Eva and her husband, and Rudolf and his wife. So Klaus and Natsuhi, Eva and um, Hideyoshi, <laughs> Rudolf and uh, Kiria. Wait, does that mean Natsuhi is already dead? We don't get shotgun wielding Natsuhi this time? I'm disappointed. But if you wanted to be sure, you'd still have to go even closer and check. Because they seemed almost like dolls. Rosa and the rest had opened the door, entered all at once with the sound of many footsteps, and called out, asking if anyone was there. And yet, there had been no reaction. Even if Rosa and the rest assumed they were being ignored, you'd still expect there to be some kind of reaction. And there hadn't even been that. So at first it felt like someone had sat down in some dolls that greatly resembled those people. By now it wasn't just Rosa, Shannon and Kanon and even Goda. They were all fighting frantically with a creepy emotion that grasped their hearts. Yeah, Nisan? Nisan? As she walked towards the altar, she called out again, but there was still no reaction. 
Yeah, it's a great time to turn off the lights. <laughs> yes, by now, Rosa was sure of it. She was sure these weren't dolls, but the people themselves... This is... They grew close enough to see clearly what lay on the table. It still looked like an adorable banquet, reminiscent of a child's birthday party. Plates piled up with sweets, cute pitchers with drinks, all kinds of pumpkin-shaped ornaments. They were all decorated in Halloween style. And, while this probably wasn't the time to be thinking it, Maria would surely have been delighted to see all this. That was the state of the table they sat in front of, apparently asleep. It was an eerie scene, as though a small, fun-looking Halloween party had been stopped in time. They're all... sleeping? When she approached even closer to them, she realized that there were snacks scattered all over the floor. Candies, cookies, soda and chocolates, all with heavily fantasy-themed packaging. They were all scattered across a carpet covered with blackberry and cranberry jam. Yeah, about that. I don't think it's jam. Rosa and the rest finally realized what the situation was. It was a Halloween party. A banquet for those not of this world. Oh damn. Gotta send that to Zimon. Okay. Lots of entrails, probably. Klaus, Natsuhi, Eva, Hideyoshi, Rudolf, and Kiria were seated in chairs, apparently asleep, but all dead. How could you tell that they were dead and not simply sleeping? That was because they'd been vertically sliced open from their chest to their stomachs. Oh god. Klaus, Yeah! How cruel. The six of them had sat down at a Halloween party, before having their stomachs split open, killing them. Then the jam covering the floor must be what overflowed from their stomachs once they'd stuffed themselves completely, right? No, the contents of their stomachs had been scattered all over the floor, and that wasn't all. Out of their stomachs it was almost as though, almost as though, as though they poured out, as though snacks had overflowed from there. Candies and cookies, soda and chocolates had poured out, stained with blood, and had scattered across the floor. What could have happened to cause this? It's almost as though their stomachs were stuffed, full to bursting with sweets, and it all poured out when their stomachs split open. Rosa remembered a certain shocking meal, a turkey that had been served at her own birthday. When it had been cut open with a knife, outflowed one of her favorite foods. But since she hadn't been told what was inside, the deep deep red ketchup omelette rice poured out like bloody maggots. Holsey, dripping, slimy, pulpy, squelching. <sighs> yeah, I'm not gonna do the screams. The trauma of her youth was revived. Rosa felt a monster raging inside her stomach as the acid started to rise. Unable to hold back, she threw it all up on the floor. Her empty stomach had nothing but stomach acid. The scene in front of her was no fun Halloween party now. The three couples were enshrined right there, their stomachs vertically wrenched open, wrenched open with the... Gugubah? The fuck? So many snacks had been stuffed in there, pulpy, squishy. Blood and guts and sweets were overflowing onto the floor, blood-stained, sticky, sticky, sloppy, pulpy, sweet snacks that made your fingers stick together, gummy, gummy. I was stained with entrails, sloppy, pulpy. What was that I stepped on just now that didn't feel like a candy or a cookie or a soda or a chocolate? <sighs> I'm scared. What did I step on? I can't even look at the bottom of my food. Foot. <sighs> what, a, what a gruesome Halloween party. From far away, it had looked truly beautiful, fantastical and fun, but from up close, it was horrible, disgusting, and yet somehow still beautiful. Rosa's wild thoughts tried as best they could to escape her throat with a loud voice that was neither a scream nor a roar. Not sure I want to. Close, Emma. 
Oh, damn. This is horrible, it's just horrible. Call an ambulance. Call an ambulance? You see what they look like? You think an ambulance is gonna help? <laughs> Beatrice knows how to party, yeah. Call the police, yeah, I guess that is fine. That's right, the police! Police, 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 police! If a word so tied to reality hadn't come out of Gorda's mouth, Rosa and the rest would probably have found themselves unable to escape that nightmarish party even now. But it wasn't because they thought the police might be able to do something. If they didn't keep yelling about the police, it felt as though another seat might be set up at this demon's party and give to them. Their own chests felt like they were expanding unpleasantly from the inside, rumbling, churning, and it was surely because candy was about to overflow from their stomachs. Rosa, once again tortured by the desire to vomit, threw her stomach exit up on the floor, and then she searched, searched to see if there was any candy in it. <sighs> anyway. Rosa coughed violently again, forcefully spitting out the stomach acid that had been burning in her throat. She realized that by now her whole body had been covered in filthy sweat. Genji san, Shannon please contact father and ask for instructions. Goda san, go with Kanan kun and call the police. Then have Dr. Nanjo come here. Why even bring Dr. Nanjo here? It's a bit too late for medical care. The servants accepted their orders and dashed outside. After watching them leave, Rosa once again stared at her siblings, with whom she'd spent good times and bad in their parents. Though there could be nothing more tragic than this scene, for some reason she was tempted to describe this fantastic death as beautiful. Damn. And you know... Whenever I upload stuff, I, I don't think it's doing that anymore, but for a time YouTube was always asking me if this was content for children when I uploaded a video. <laughs> and when I uploaded the first really violent murder part of Umi Neko, it was just really funny for YouTube to ask me that. So I just pictured YouTube asking me that again when I upload this episode. Yeah, I'm gonna go with no. They aren't here. Where did they go? The servant room and the kitchen are both empty. What in the world happened? Mama, where's Mama? I wonder is this uh Oh, okay. Gonna look at that in a, in a minute. I wonder if Rosa is gonna be the Natsuhi with sh with a shotgun this time. His corpse was found in the chapel. The direct cause of death is unknown, but it seems his stomach was cut open and his intestines pulled out after his death. On top of that, sweets and candies were packed into his stomach. Welcome, Maria. Happy Halloween. The corpse was found in the chapel records. Uh, seems to be the same. Didn't I tell you? Stomachs are packed full of candy. Everyone has a stomach filled with sweet dreams. Mm -hmm. Why would there be anything filthy inside someone's stomach? Why is into in this line here, but it's in this line here? Whatever. This is why I want to be as sweet as and innocent as candy. And so I give you the land of dreams. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Given her aggression problems, kind of have mixed feelings about handing Rosa a gun. That is true. I, I do wonder if the gun is going to come up again. Oh. He's still... I mean, he was still alive when when the, the day started. I wonder if he's gonna have a more active role this time. My letter! The letter I got from Pietro! Give it back! Give it back! Wow! Perplexing. Bathakun, are you sure it was Androsa? Well, even I was half asleep, so I'm not too sure, but I get the feeling that in the early morning Aunt Rosa came in and fished around in Maria's handbag. War noch nicht durch? What do you mean? Did I miss something? I figured there was probably a tube of toothpaste or something in there. Why would there be a tube of toothpaste in Maria's handbag? Looks like you were a little more than half asleep. But a battler vaguely remembered Rosa entering the cousin room. Curie and Rudolph, didn't I look at them? I thought I did. 
Yeah, I, I did. Checked all. Um, also, when Maria woke up before the rest of them, she'd started rampaging around, saying that someone had opened the envelope she'd been keeping safe. It's kind of fucked up if, if it was intended that she would open the envelope and go to the church and find the <laughs> She would be the one to find the scene. Damn. Then again, it d she wasn't exactly bothered by any murders in the episode one, so who knows how she would react. Putting two and two together, they figured that Rosa had probably come and opened the envelope. A letter from the Golden Witch. I wonder what was inside. I don't know, but that envelope was for Grandfather's personal use, and it had the pseudo Mia family crests on it. Whatever was inside, it must have had some connection to the family conference. Uh, also, sorry to stop once again. But Second Twilight will tear apart those who are closed, and... There are not really many people left now, apart from Shannon and George. Uh-oh. I mean, who else? Could Beatrice and Kinzel die? That would be interesting. Anyway. She hadn't let anyone touch it, but yesterday Maria had shown that envelope off to Battler and the rest a whole lot, so they remembered it well. Ah, Mama, give it back! Mama, give it back! Ah, wah. You know, we could just search for her. Well, if you're if you're right, it would have to be pretty important. Why would this mighty witch give something that important to Maria? I don't get it. Every once in a while, the refreshing morning atmosphere was completely wiped out by the sound of thunder. It was only natural. Since the moment they'd woken up, they hadn't met anyone else. It felt like only they were left, as if the mansion had become an empty husk. Hey, anyone there? Hey, answer me. Jessica called out into the hallway, and eventually an answer came back. It came from the entrance hall. Wizard, I can hear you. Has something happened? Oh, it's George. It's, it's, no, it's not George. George is reacting to it. It's Dr. Nanjo. Thank goodness. It looks like everyone but us hasn't disappeared from this island after all. Dr. Nanjo, good morning. Uh, sorry, but do you know where our parents went? Dear me, I only just woke up and came here, you see. I have no way of knowing for sure, but let's see. It was only natural. Nanja was a guest just like the rest of them. He'd come just now to pass the time in the parlor until breakfast. Dr. Nanja, Mama took it! Mama took my letter! Boom! Give it back, give it back! Maria buried her face in Nanja's plump stomach, sobbing and crying. Nanja could do nothing but be bewildered by this ruckus so early in the morning. Oh, someone's running this way. Jessica! Uh-oh, someone's coming! From down the hall, they could sense people running hurriedly. They saw Gorda and Khanum coming towards them. Normally, it would be disgraceful for a servant to run inside the mansion, and yet Battler and the rest didn't even think to question that now. Maria's sobbing had become so unmanageable, they wanted to ask someone, anyone, where Rosa was. But the two servants seemed to have bigger things on their minds than Jessica, who was waving at them. Gorda flew into the servant room, and when Khanum noticed that Nanja was there, he bowed and approached the doctor at a quick pace before whispering something into his ear. What did you say? Rosa Sunday? Yes. I will guide you, so please accompany me. Understood. This way. Without saying anything more than that, Kanon finally noticed Jessica and bowed to her. But he wasn't calm. He dashed back to the down the corridor by which he had come, followed by Nanjo. By looking at how hurried they were, Bettler and the rest realized that yes, something bad really had happened. They saw Goda through the door... Uh, they saw Gorda through the door to the servant room, which had been flung open. He was holding the receiver and violently pressing the hook. From that they realized that he was trying to call a hospital or the police. In any event, he was trying to call someone because a serious emergency had occurred. Let's have a look. Yeah. Mama, get back! Get back my letter! It's an invitation to the Golden Land! They didn't know what, but something was happening. Battler and the rest chased after Kanon and Anjo. Oh, and then we realized, Conan Kun had called Dr. Nanjo, but he hadn't called us, so we shouldn't have gone with them. I wonder if Alice regretted her excess curiosity when she chased after that rabbit holding a clock. <laughs> so I guess they're following? No, you mustn't go in. You mustn't look. Jessica-chan, no!